peace be upon you. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. I begin <coughs> invoking God's name, with God's name, the merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer. Um, before I get to my specific comments of two issues I think that we should be concerned about and suggesting some actions, and I will give two cases as examples. I like to remind us of something, and it relates to the conversations we've had and we've heard about informants. I'm going to mention two cases that talk about informants as well. They're called confidential informants. But if you know anything about how informants work, there's always two types of informants, and sometimes we go to sleep about the second type of informant. Or, in, or perhaps you're familiar with this, I want to remind you. Normally how confidential informants work is there's a confidential informant that lays low and he's observing things and he, uh, bug, he bugs himself for wiretaps and take notes and, and reports back to a field agent which then kicks the information up and then after they get enough information then they take it to the U.S. attorney and then they indict the person on whatever type of charges that th there may be. The other type which I'm going to get to, especially in terms of the second case, is the agent provocateur. And there are signs of agent provocateurs. Always be careful of the person who comes around you who's the biggest rabble rouser, the one who speaks the loudest, who tries to get you incited, because nine times out of ten, if someone's coming around you all of a sudden who wasn't that way or a new person coming around say oh yeah what do you think about oh yeah those devils over in Israel or they, oh yeah look how they're killing all the Muslims over in Afghanistan we gotta do something that's the, that's the confidential informant who's acting as an agent provocateur in the Quran the term in Arabic is called munafiq that's the sellout hypocrite who's yep. trying to set you up that's right. so be aware of that because in, in terms of what happened with the Black Panther Party, the assassination of Fred Hampton, we can go through many types of cases historically That's right. where we've seen this, these agent provocateurs working with the Federal Bureau of Investigations. Now, let me tell you something about the first case. I'm going to give an example. This is something that can be easily rectified, not through the legislative process, but through the executive branch through President Barack Hussein Obama. Unfortunately, from our perspective, there are certain things regarding civil liberties that have gotten worse under President Barack Hussein Obama in comparison to George W. Bush, and especially as it relates to American Muslims. You know, uh, Mr. Zogby at Arab American Institute just had a press conference where they did a poll saying how President Obama's approval rating in the Middle East is lower than Bush in his last year in office. Now why, why is that? Why is that? Now I'm going to give the connection because there's a domestic connection with the international connection. One of these things is that, and this has been reported nationally, but more so even on Al Jazeera than even our corporate media here. But in the final days of the Bush administration, the Department of Justice instituted some new guidelines in which FBI agents have more authority and they've been since recently expanded by Attorney General Eric Holder. This relates to DOJ guidelines of initiating what are called initial threat assessments. The Department of Justice has now given the FBI the power and the authority that an agent can say, oh, um, you know, without predication, they can start something that's called an initial threat assessment that's not really what they call a full-fledged investigation in which they can follow and trail people, that they can surveil people, um, and not as primary factors, but factors of consideration can be ethnicity, national origin, and religion. This is something that can be easily rectified by President Barack Hussein Obama giving a directive to U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder. And if this man is talking about change we can believe in, 
we have to hold him accountable. There's a saying in Islam, it's a saying of Prophet Muhammad that says, help your brother where he, whether he is mazlum, whether he's oppressed or a zalim. So his companions said to, uh, to the Prophet, we know how to help the oppressed person, but how do we help the oppressor? Prophet Muhammad said, stop him from oppressing and that's how you help him. So how we can help President Obama is that we have to call him out on these types of issues that are usurping our constitutional rights. Now in this one particular case, I want to, uh, to mention is a case of a Chaldean American from here. And I'm mentioning her case specifically because she's from here. Her name is Dawn Hanna. Dawn Hanna, a Chaldean American, and for those who don't, who are not familiar with Chaldeans, these are Christians, Catholic. She had a particular case where she was involved in brokering information, uh, not brokering information, brokering um, different types of goods and products from here to the Middle East. Between 2002, 2003, she sent some uh, old telecommunications equipment that she picked up secondhand. She sent it to Turkey, and she sold it to a Kurdish fellow. This Kurdish fellow, however, was not a Turkish citizen. He was an Iraqi citizen. This is time, this is during the time of the sanctions against Iraq and Saddam Hussein. Come to find out this man and, and his so-called business partner were actually CIA assets. They sent this telecommunication, uh, telecommunication, uh, telecommunications equipment into Iraq. Later after on in this so-called war on terror, Dawn was indicted for being involved in sending telecommunications equipment violating U.S. sanctions and the CIA agent um, um, informant uh, asset blew his cover. He blew his cover and signed a sworn affidavit along with another person saying that Miss Hannah had no idea that these, uh, this equipment would be going to Iraq. Now this leads to the second point. This is through the legislative branch, and this probably will have to be challenged in court. But it's the usage of something by the federal government called SIPA, Classified Information Procedures Act, and some of you also know it by another name, or something called Secret Evidence. How Dawn was convicted was that when, these, uh, when she found these people were actually CIA assets and she got sworn affidavits, this these affidavits were blocked from being introduced to her trial because the government said, oh, it's a secret, it's going to compromise classified information, it's going to blow the cover of our CIA assets, which would be some type of national security, uh, um, would, would place our national security in harm. The problem with this is the, the attorney with the United States government didn't even go through or contact the CIA to say, is this violating Will this place our national security in danger? She took it upon her own self. And uh, her attorneys believe, as, as well as many activists believe, this is what is called a Brady violation for failure to disclose evidence that could have been introduced into a United States citizen getting a fair trial. Because if a jury would have heard that she sent this stuff to a guy in Turkey who was a Kurdish Iraqi and she didn't know it was going to Iraq, I believe the jury would have acquitted her. Now the second thing, uh, the, the second case, and I have to mention, and by the way, you can get more information about this case on www.justice4, the numeral, Dawn Hanna, H-A-N-N-A.com, justiceforDawnHanna.com. Now the second piece is the Imam Lukman case. We're talking about confidential informants and this whole issue about how also we need to push for uh, reform on the usage of informants by both DOJ and DHS. In this particular case with Imam Lukman, they sent in three confidential informants looking for so-called terrorism activity. And by the way, no one in that Imam or no one involved in that case was charged with anything terrorism related. They sent in the confidential informants, then uh, they couldn't find charges of terrorism. They had them wiretapped. Uh, the, one of the informants took trips with the imam out of town. I actually met this informant. No tell how many informants I've met that I don't know about. But this one particular informant comes up Jibril. 
It might be an informant in here. That's why I record everything. Because in transparency, there's protection. Now, with this, in, with this informant, I call that constellation prize with the Imam Luqman's case. They couldn't find terrorism, so they went to this poor mosque in the poorest city in America, and the confidential informant offers the individuals some work at a legitimate looking commercial warehouse. I've been to the warehouse several times uh, after, the, uh, after the homicide, mind you, not beforehand. For someone trying to think that I was up in there moving some stuff. Now, in this case, um, these people went to this commercial warehouse moving the stuff that the government paid for. That's why the people were charged with conspiracy for handling stolen merchandise. It's conspiracy, not actually moving stolen um, um, merchandise, stolen goods, because it wasn't stolen. It was like over a million dollars of stuff paid for by our taxpayer dollars. Right, including the rental of the warehouse and then the goods and all these things. Um, so this, as I told the head of the FBI here, Andy Arena, you're welcome to come in the front door. Come in the front door. And even if someone wants to hear the sermons or send an agent or come into the mosque, no problem. I told them, come in. You might hear something you like. I preach at all the mosques in this area. I spoke at one in Rochester Hills. Come and listen, you might hear something you like, but in terms of we don't need the FBI using agent provocateurs inciting people to commit crimes when there was no criminal enterprise ongoing in the mosque. That happened in this case, that happened in the Newburg uh, case where those brothers were set up when those dirty, I don't even want to use the word, where they set up one brother saying, you know, we're going to give you some money to save your your brother's life, because he needs a liver transplant, would give you $30,000. One of the guys is a diagnosed schizophrenic who was homeless, another one who was a crack addicted. This is the type of stuff that's going on. Now, I want to mention this one brother up here. Um, I know, basically, a majority of these people here and here, or I know their family members. This one brother, Ali Abdul Rakib, that was involved in the Mashable Hawk case, where the media said they were a so-called extremist group that was trying to overthrow the government to establish the Sharia law. <laughs> this brother right here, you know what he got? He ended up taking a plea bargain. He was tired of fighting. For so-called wanting to overthrow the government, he got one year probation and a $100 fine. I told the U.S. Attorney Barbara McQuaid here, you're insulting our intelligence because if I spray painted obscenities uh, on Central High School off of Linwood near Burlingame, I would get a bigger fine than a $100 fine if I spray painted some MFers and some Bs and some stuff like that on the high school. And you mean to tell me that you're trying to say these people were involved in a plot to move stolen goods to overthrow the government and you give them a $100 fine and a year probation? How dare you insult our intelligence? But that is a type of shenanigans, shenanigans, it's an Irish word, isn't it? <laughs> See, we, we believe in uh, diversity. That type of shenanigans. <laughs> the shenanigans that's going on under the Justice Department during the presidency of President Barack Hussein Obama. So we have to, and I voted for President Obama. I can say that. Now, my organization, we don't endorse any people. But I'm saying this for my own personal self. If President Obama, because he's going to be in trouble the next election anyway, because he's compromising too much with the, with, 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 with the debt ceiling and all types of other issues, he's compromised too much. If he can't get these situations right with civil rights, I'm telling you, Ron Paul who's in the GOP is more progressive on many of these civil rights issues than President Obama. I'm telling you personally, I'll be out there campaigning for Ron Paul. Now this is not my, in my care capacity, my personal capacity. Because Ron Paul on many of these issues on militarization, on these civil rights issues, Patriot Act, he's far more better than Obama. With that, I, I need to sit down. Thank you. <laughs>